my sobriety date is January 28th, 2002, and my home group is the Pastor Platitudes group here on Dashon Island in in Washington. Um, I have a sponsor. He has a sponsor. I sponsor people. So that's what we do in this program. Um, I read today's daily reflection, which will be part of the topic of today's meeting, and I thought, that's a good way to start what I'm going to share with you guys today, which is, um, it says, uh, no God and no peace, no God, no peace. Um, and I really like that little thing at the, at the bottom of our daily reflection today. Um, so I thought I'd start out with my, my story with you, um, a little bit about my journey with, into my spiritual experience. Um, I was raised, um, devoutly Catholic uh, I had a lovely looking home and a lovely looking family. Unfortunately, a lot of bad things were going in on behind those doors. Um, all of those things definitely caused some serious trauma in my life. Um, and that is just part of the base of my story. Um, I was very active in the faith of my understanding um, up until I went off to college. And you know, it was, my religion was a really, really important part of my life. I went to a, a Catholic high school, I was very active in the ministry there. It was a really important part of my life. Um, I didn't really start drinking until I went to college, and I went to a Catholic college, because that's what good Catholic girls do. And the first weekend I was there, and I had dabbled in alcohol, and I tried marijuana once before college. Um, and then... I got to college and the first weekend I was there, someone needed me to hold the door and they had a case of beer and I said they had to pay the beer tax. And I was off and running um, from that day forward. And I got to know that group of people. And the second weekend I was at college, I took off with them to the coast. I was in Oregon, so we went out to the Oregon coast. I got drunk, I got high, and I cheated on my boyfriend back home. So that pretty much was me as an alcoholic was once it started, I was off to the races, no holds barred, full on, you know, alcoholic, making bad choices, doing stupid things, um, you know, all the things that we do when we drink. But one of the things that happened to me is once I started to drink and use, I tried to go to church and I walked into the church and I knew because, of course, it's all about me that everyone there was judging me for my behavior and my actions. So I stopped going to church. It was that quick because I was raised to believe that I had to behave a certain way to get God's love. And I had broken all of those things. You know, I had totally messed up. You know, God hated me now. I sucked. That was it. I stopped going to church. I mean, it was literally that fast. Within the the second Sunday after I had done all those horrible things I told you about, um, I couldn't go to church anymore. I just thought, that's it. I'm out. I'm out with God. That's all there is to it. Um, And so, you know, my drinking and using story isn't special. It isn't unique. There's a lot of partying, a lot of passing out, a lot of other, other substances other than alcohol. This intense trying not to be an addict and an alcoholic because I didn't want to be that person, right? I didn't want to be an addict and an alcoholic. My mom had given me those warnings that, you know, Bill talks about in his story about our family, you know, don't, whatever you do, you know, you got to be careful. You don't want to be like grandma. You don't want to end up like crazy aunt Kitty, right? And I love the fact that my whole family referred to my great aunt Kitty as crazy aunt Kitty, who happened to be bipolar, addicted to pills, and an alcoholic, but she was referred to as crazy and kitty, right? So that was sort of the prejudice I was raised with around drugs and alcohol. So I was, I tried so hard not to be an alcoholic and not to be an addict. And I had so many rules, all the rules of things that I couldn't, couldn't do. So part of the time it was fun on the weekends, but any other time it was torture trying not to be an alcoholic because I wasn't going to be an alcoholic. Now I could diagnose anyone else with alcoholism, that was no problem. You know, I knew about an alcoholic when I saw one. And strangely, by the way, that perfect looking family, somehow my parents didn't drink, which is crazy, right? I mean, because it's like, I should, you know, sometimes I wish they would, you know, my mom was narcissistic, my dad was physically abusive. um, And I thought, well, maybe if they drink, they'd calm the heck down, but they didn't drink. So I was raised in a you know, pretty much, you know, on occasion, my dad might have a beer. 
but rare, only if someone else was over. I mean, just alcohol wasn't part of my upbringing. Um, and of course, the interesting fact is that I have a brother who is still out there and also became an addict. Um, and, you know, he, his drug of choice is a dry good, but it is still something that, you know, it's what he does for a living. I like to say he's a horticulturalist. Um, it just, it sounds better, right? Um, but for me, my drinking and using put this, as I was talking about, with my relationship with a higher power, it just slammed it shut. Um, and I constantly was trying not to be an alcoholic, trying not to do all these things that would make me a bad person, that would make me an alcoholic. I was so hard on myself, constantly judging myself. Um, and as I went through this in that first attempt at college, because there was two, um, I finally also started getting profoundly depressed and having horrible panic attacks, um, dropping class left and right and finally after two and a half years in college I quit because I just couldn't anymore I couldn't do it anymore I couldn't I'd walk into a classroom and start having anxiety and panic attacks um, I was missing classes because I was drinking every night and using dry goods every night and everything was just falling apart so all these plans I had myself for myself I was going to be a doctor I was there pre-med from the time I had been little I knew that that was my plan in life was to be a doctor and I wanted to go into emergency medicine and after two and a half years, I was done. I couldn't, I couldn't go to school anymore. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew that I couldn't be a doctor because I was a raging alcoholic. But again, I wasn't because, you know, that would have meant that I was admitting that I had a problem and I was unwilling to do that. Um, so as things progressed um, and my life progressed, I, you know, partied. I worked at banks. I had a, what I thought was a good time. Um, you know, despite the fact that I constantly would hurt myself by like falling down or running into a lamppost or all those sort of things. I think the only reason I didn't end up in a DUI during that time was because we got to walk everywhere that we went because where I lived in the city. But again, walking was hard. I want a t-shirt that says that I frequently would fall down. Um, but at that point, I thought I was having a good time because I surrounded myself with other addicts and alcoholics, and I can see that now. So, And I like to surround myself th with people who were a worse problem. So I was living up on Capitol Hill in Seattle during the 90s, and that was the height of the heroin epidemic. So I had a few friends that were heroin addicts, and they really had a problem. See, I didn't have a problem because I wouldn't stick a needle in my arm. Right? They had a problem. I was fine. And that was one of the things I did was surround myself with people who either drank like me or drank worse than me, that used like me or used worse than me. That was one of the ways that I was able to prove to myself that I didn't have a problem. So um, I did go back to college. I barely graduated. Um, I nearly got kicked out of school for cheating on an exam. I frequently cheated on exams because I was too drunk or hungover to um, make it through an exam. So I took advantage of that opportunity, um, any chance I could get. And so I barely made it through college. Um, I still have nightmares that I missed a class. I don't know if anyone else has that. I'm not going to graduate. <laughs> Raise your hand. Um, I mean, so that, that nightmare is still ongoing to this day. But I, I somehow graduated. And I got a degree in psychology, which I think is pretty funny. While I was in college, during my addiction studies class, I wrote a paper on how marijuana is not addictive. Um, because, hello, I was justifying the fact that I didn't have a problem in college, in a paper I wrote, like a well-researched, you know, scientific article that I wrote about how marijuana was an addicting because I didn't want to have an addiction. So this was just this constant thing. And even though, again, I was going to a Catholic college, I wasn't going to church. I didn't go to church. Every now and then I'd wander into a church and I just feel horrible just like God hates me this is awful um, one time I was on a big bender and I was in Reno and I finally wandered outside and somehow ended up in a church and I because I didn't know what else to do and I was having this like complete because I was using many things and it was snowing and I felt like I was in a snow globe and I was losing it right but somehow in my wandering I wandered into a church I don't know why I wandered in there and I left but that's where I ended up so I think 
my higher power was constantly begging me, please come back, please come back. And I was like, no, 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 because you judge me. Um, and then when I fell in love with a woman who was also raised Catholic, I tried going to church a little bit because she still went to church, but it still really felt awful. But then we moved back to Seattle and we found a church that was very accepting of gay and lesbian people. So we started trying to go to church there and then we decided to get married. And I, t I taught Sunday school along with everything else. So I went to the church and to the archdiocese, which is the head of the church, and said, listen, we just want to use our church. We don't want the sacrament of marriage. Like, I understand that's not available to us. And this person who, you know, spoke for the archdiocese said, basically, it's never going to happen ever, 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 never in your lifetime. Get the hell out. And he said it very nicely, but that was the message. And so we left directly from there straight to a bar where I tied one on like no one's business and that was the last time I went to church I never went back to that church again if they don't want me I don't want them God doesn't want me because I couldn't see at that point in my life that God wasn't the Catholic Church and you know we learn in this program that a life led on deep resentment is not a good thing and it will lead to our death and I had a deep and abiding resentment towards my higher power um, and so finally, um, as my depression worsened, as my anxiety worsened, as my drinking and using worsened, um, I, you know, was pretty much, I started working for myself and I was a great boss. So again, I, that last year was hell. Um, I finally went to, called my therapist and said, I want to die. I don't know what to do. And she kindly suggested that I try a 12 step program. And so I walked into those doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and this wonderful woman named Molly wrapped her arms around me and told me, as I said, I, this is my first wham, and I just started to cry. She wrapped her arms around me and said, everything's going to be okay. You're okay. You're home. And I haven't drank or used since that day, um, January 28th of 2002. Um, relapse does not have to be part of your story. It is not part of my story. But I was angry. I was so angry when I came into the rooms. I was crazy. I was depressed. I was anxious. But I was pissed. And everyone kept telling me how angry I was. And I kept telling them I wasn't angry because I didn't yell, scream, or throw things, which was my example of anger. Um, but I was angry to the point that I crossed out every place in how it works and 86, 87, and 89 that it said God or him and crossed that out, put higher power or HPs throughout my entire big book because I was angry and screw God. Um, I did end up going to rehab when I had about 90 days sober because I was going crazy and either it was go to rehab or be locked up someplace else because I was a danger to myself at that point. And I got into this huge fight at rehab because I said the only prayer I say to God is fuck you and someone took a section with that but someone else told me you know what at least you're talking to God because I was angry you guys I was so angry at God because God judged me and God hated me and all these things and then finally in working this program and working a four step and writing up the Catholic Church I realized I wasn't mad at God right I was upset about an organization not God. And those two things are so separate for me. There's spirituality and there's religion. And I became an extremely spiritual person where my relationship with my higher power is the most important thing in my life. Because I know that it is that relationship that I've received and been given through doing the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've had that spiritual experience. And mine was the slowest variety possible. I mean, just digging myself out. I didn't even like to say the word God. You know, I just didn't. And my spirituality has blossomed in so many different ways and it constantly is growing which is the most amazing thing about this program so if you come into this program if you're here and you're new and your only thought is fuck god there is no god god sucks that's okay because that's how i came in and that it doesn't have to stay that way right you're going to come to an understanding of what a higher power truly is and what that actually means to you this pain you're feeling when you're coming in with all that hate and loathing or frustration or lack of belief or understanding of what the heck a higher power is, that doesn't have to be your life. That is temporary and it will grow over time and it will change over time. You know, and I've come to really live with 
the fact that I respect all faiths and religion. I don't abide by many of them. I no longer consider myself a Christian. Um, I think Jesus, great guy, great writing in that book, not for me. Um, you know, I don't identify as being Catholic. I don't even say I'm a recovering Catholic. I don't think that that's fair. I still have people in my family and life who find great pleasure in the Catholic Church. Um, you know, I'm not angry at the church anymore because I was able to write that four step and let go of that anger and pray in my fifth, sixth, seven, eight to have it removed from me. And trust me, it took a while for me to stop being angry at those people. And to be able to remember there were some people that treated me wonderfully and that were like parents to me. And, you know, I realized that too in my coming to recovery was that I had such bad parents that the church was like a father to me. And so when the church rejected me or what I saw as the church rejecting me, I took it as a father figure rejecting me. And that was my pain. And I had to deal with that, that there were these men and women that I met within the church that were wonderful and supportive and loving. You know, again, they weren't the organization and kind of coming to an understanding that, you know, for those of us who come in with a previous religious experience that didn't necessarily turn out good for ourselves, you know, we can reframe that. We can look at that. And that's the gift that the steps give us because the result of these steps is a spiritual experience. So when you work the 12 steps with a sponsor, you will have a spiritual experience. And if that spiritual experience, is different for every single last one of us, right? It's why in our meetings, we don't read from the Bible. We don't read from the Quran. We don't read things like that. We read AA approved literature because it's important that when we reach out, we are reaching out to everyone that's here. So I'm going to tell you that I read from a lot of different books. This one here in its fancy cover, <laughs> this is my big book. I just, it was falling apart. And actually I just got a new one and it took me days to transfer all my notes over the only thing I didn't do that was in my old big book is I didn't have to cross out the word God okay? that didn't have to happen in this big book I wasn't angry at God in this big book so everything else is the same except for that and I did circle all the spots in my new big book that I had previously crossed out because I don't want to forget because that is such an important part of my story an important part of what I want to share with all of you um, you know so as we talk today you know about our relationship with a higher power and about our fifth step because we're in the fifth month of the year you know those places that's where you can receive that healing so please you know keep coming back to meetings Get yourself a sponsor. Work these steps. This is available to any single one of you out there. You never have to relapse because I didn't have to, and I was a raging alcoholic and a you know daily drinker and drug user. You know, it was the first thing I did every morning when I woke up, and the last thing I did every night before I went to bed. You know, it wasn't on occasion. By the end, it was all day, every day, nonstop. That last year was hell, absolute hell for me. Um, and, you know, I frequently was joked as I've come through the years that I kind of look like Susie Mary Sunshine. So it's hard to believe, you know, that, you know, tw almost 20 years down the line that I was a raging alcoholic and drug addict. Like, because I don't look like what people think a raging alcoholic and drug addict looks like. When I came into the rooms, I did. Okay. My life was such a disaster area. My wife was ready to leave me. She couldn't take it anymore. She told me she had two plans. One, if she could take a truck with her. One, if she left with nothing. You know, my life now includes some really amazing things. I run my own business. It's successful, and I'm extremely good at what I do. I'm a professional dog trainer, and I love what I do. I love my work. Um, and I know now that emergency medicine probably would have killed me because I don't have the temperament for that. I don't know how someone like Della does it. I have a lot of friends that are first responders, and I know it would have killed me. Um, just because of my previous trauma and the trauma that occurs when you do that kind of work. Mm -mm. But that was my plan, was to do a job that was going to kill me, yeah. right? Now I do a job that I love. I get paid, like today, this afternoon, I'm going to get paid to go play with someone's year-old rough collie, right? Someone's going to pay me to go teach them how to get their dog not to bark. I mean, who wants not? I, I get played, and sometimes literally eight-week-old puppies. I mean, come on, how much more can you have fun with your life, right? I also, some of you have seen or heard, I have two adorable boys that are about to turn 11, which is mind blowing. They've never seen their mom drunk. They've never seen me high. Um, and Alcoholics Anonymous is part of their lives. You know, they know all about it. 
they pop their heads into meetings. They've gone to meetings. One of my all-time favorite photos is one of me holding my babies when I was getting my nine-year chip. Um, someone took this great picture. I have both of them sleeping on me because they were just um, And, you know, that's what I have. I have this amazing relationship with my wife. Now, this is the most amazing thing for this girl. She and I don't fight. There's no yelling that happens in our household. Well, except for the kids. But between each other, no. Because, you know, I and again, it's promised, that's promised in our book. That that's, we don't, we cease fighting anyone or anything. You know, if we don't, dis, if we disagree about something, we talk about it kindly. You know, I had to learn in therapy and in this program that to tell your wife to fuck off or go to hell is not okay. Because to me, that was how two people who are married communicated with each other. Right, that never happens. We don't yell at each other. We disagree for sure, you know, but we don't yell, we don't fight. I have ceased fighting anyone and anything, and I have turned my will and my life over to a power greater than myself. And I truly believe that the only step that you have to take correctly every single day is the third step. Because if you turn your will and your life over the care of your higher power every single day, your higher power does not want you drunk and does not want you high. Your higher power wants what's best for you, and it will take you so far. Um, but you do need to do the rest of the steps if you want to have that spiritual experience. Um, and with that, it looks like my time is up. So I hope you all took something out of my message. Um, and I love every single member of Alcoholics Anonymous, which means I love every single one of you. Um, and thank you, Irene, for asking me to share today. I really appreciate it.